Ile kufuwa uruwa Shile kufuwa u Iwalo miwa Iwalo miwa Shile kufuwa u How many of you know that song? Where is the other thing of that song? That song is one of our oldest ancestral songs. It was a zero book, and it literally translates to help me, my ancestors, to basically get through what I'm going through. And it was sung by the first Africans to reach here. And it is still being sung by a few people who know it today, but none of you all do. And the reason for that is probably what we just spoke about. Um, we're not studying that in school, so it's not your concern. Um, I don't care what you tell me, I understand how much work, so. Sorry, we want to move. That's the last one. Let me read this, and then ask how to talk. Because you know how to talk, too. When the reality of our situation finally hits us, it will shatter our jaws, and for what we will be justified in saying nothing. The homeless who set up three corner classes to teach survival tactics to million upper class people. The new survival man will be a vegan. Bank walls will be used to store food, and fat men will be the most attractive women on earth, and they will no longer be called fat, but successful. <laughs> Politicians will be eaten on sight. Warriors will wear their tongues around their necks like medallions. Rich men will first try to buy food with their money. When that fails, they will try to eat their money. When that fails, they will be able to keep warm. When that fails, they will go mad. Rich men will go mad. Technology will be irrelevant, and computers will be mined for metals. We will try to fish on the west coast and suddenly realize that pollution is a problem. Places like Movie Town, Hyatt, the Marriott will have no air conditioning due to power cuts and will be rendered useless as pop horn, pop films and high ceilings become luxuries we can ill afford. We will sorry we cut down the mangrove. The zoo and the grocery store will be one and the same. A man will beg you to trade him a plate of pay off with a range of us poor. That man will be asked, do you have anything else? That man will be asked, are you insane? That man will be told, you cannot eat a car. That man will try to eat his car. So, artists will be seen as a nuisance, as people will no longer have the energy or possess the strength to jump wine and wave at the same time. <laughs> a child will be born who will look at the rusted remnant of a car and ask, what is that? A child will be told, that was a mistake. At the edge of the world, there is much to discuss. The children are talking about the future, but with the ozone they are depleted, these words have taken on new meaning. The perverse world we are used to reverses in the future, no more pure cross and lynching, with all that skin can sell burning, that white folks begin to wish for melanin. They pray, God making black as cold and safe from the sun. Racism is reduced to a joke we tell over the bonfires, fed by the bodies of those too stubborn to integrate. The last great front of it of natural irony wipes out every Caribbean island except Haiti, and so the place we refuse to see houses us all as Haitian refugees. Rap artists are not to their bling which is then melted down and used to make arrowheads to hunt rap artists for the ring. <laughs> <laughs> and I pray that I'm not around to read this one. As poets will be shot on sight for the looks on their faces which will say only one thing. I told you so. Right. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm going to get a serious voice? A serious thing will be able to do at the same time we can laugh. Um, my name is Norman Markin. I came over to this university, let me go back, we were before that. Um, at 19, I came back from Africa, for two years in Africa. I left when I was six, and decided it didn't make no sense, and I went to Africa for two years, where I learned Arabic and travel around a little bit. And when I came back, I learned science my whole life, and I went to Wasa and worked as a, a, a pump attendant in Wasa, basically put in clean in your water. We should be very afraid of the people who are working to put them clearly in the water. <laughs> yeah? Um, we're supposed to check the water every three hours. Right? Uh, my first week I come to school and I come to the, the job and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this here yeah, every three hours and check it right there. And after a week, the member who came to plant said to me, you're going to get us in trouble. Right? Because you're checking every three hours, you're going in every three hours. We check it once a day. Check it once a day. Right? This is your water. Okay? You put me in charge of filters. And it was a clean of the filters, the carbon filter, whatever. And 
he asked me to come on the new computer, I was 10 years old. And I sent him that invoice for him to come to change it. And you know what they told me? They said that when they do those changes, they have to work extra shifts. And they don't get paid for it necessarily, as much as they would. So they don't ask for it. Right? They don't ask for it. Alright? That's your work, huh? Yeah? They go meet the carony, went up into the carony plant, and one day from the fetus in the arm. From the fetus in the, in the intake. And um, I realized at that point that Wasser and Trinidad does not treat uh, for heavy metals, no kind of different stuff. All we treat for, we put chlorine and we let the water settle. And that's it. I said all I had to say. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided I couldn't go on my whole life like that. So I decided to come back to university. I came in and I did physics, math, and chemistry. I got an A plus in physics. A in math and a B plus, no, a B plus in physics, a in math and a plus in chemistry. Yeah? I tried to get into chemical engineering. And we were once in a run around. But Bridget got three C's and got into chemistry without a question. I don't know what happened. You know, but he knows somebody I didn't know. Eventually he let me into, chem into civil engineering. And um, by about the eighth month, I already was just fed up. Because I write. That's what I do. I couldn't write anymore. And I was in a technical drawing class. Which those of you who might be very civil know that every technical drawing class is, a, is, a, um, is like an exam, right? And they, I had never done it in my life, so it was completely new to me. And I asked the tutor, I said, I need more help to do this. And he said to me, Why don't you copy and get your mask like everybody else? I put down my instruments, I got up, I left everything, my books, everything. I took my bar, with my book in it that I was writing in time. And I left the class. And I've never gone back to civil engineering since then. I went straight to admin and took a, a, a leave of absence. And from there I decided I wanted to do literature. Now listen to this. This is how great every system we have this, right? I wanted to do literature. But I had no prerequisites for literature. Right? And so they made me do a year of theater. Which had no bearing on a literature degree. Right? So in essence, I had wasted two years. Not wasted. Because when they put me into theatre, what that man just said about the woman who went into the dance studio for the first time, and she was like, hey, I went to a class, and this is what I saw the first day I went to class. On the door of the class it says, please take off your shoes. We do not work with shoes in here. I was born. <laughs> like, take off your shoes? I hate shoes. Never liked them. Went into the class and told to myself, this can't be real. Like, I get graded for this. Like I have to work in this, you know, I can, I can do this. This is something that I can actually do in my life. I want to, you know. And I felt so at home, you know. And I've learned so much by being up at Creative Arts. I mean, how many of you have ever been to Creative Arts? You know, up to Creative Arts. You see, I got, I got food. How many of you don't even know what Creative Arts is? Not the one, don't you? The next one. The little old house up there. People, you know, work around really and bust their ass. You know. And the university, this university, does not focus on that at all. If you look at the new buildings we have and buildings like this, and you go to Creative Arts, right? Every year the Creative Arts Center puts on a production that the whole of Trinidad looks at, that the whole of Trinidad admires, that has brought forward some of the best actors, actresses, and dancers in this country. But if you go to the, the one little studio we have, the black box, it's like, yeah. You know, the floor just get a little remodeling, there are bats in the building, you're bound to get bite by a mosquito, but we persevere through that. We persevere. And then you come on campus, you tell somebody, somebody asks me, what are you studying? Well, I studied literature and theater. And at that time, I was just doing theater. You know, and I still had my little issues. So when somebody asks me, I tell them I'm still doing engineering. <laughs> and you laugh, but it's a painful thing. Because the thing that you love, you've been taught to be embarrassed about it. Because what the hell are you going to do with theater? What are you going to do? When I left engineering, my grandmother didn't talk to me for six months. I mean, we live alone in a very small house. You know, six months, and she talks all the time. She didn't talk. You know? So, in the face of that, how many of you are pleased with what you're doing right now? Like, you're doing what you want to do here. It's not a shift. You know? And every time I ask the question, a few hands go up. A few, just a few. Just a few hands go up. People go, I think that is because, and I put it forward a proposal, let me tell you all that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are many other universities in the world, if they exist at all, where you step in 
and immediately you have to decide exactly what you want to do. If you miss in your first year in UE, I guarantee you, as somebody who has done it, you will spend almost two extra years here. And people will be asking you, you still here? You know? You still in UE? You still in UE? You know? And, you make a, and people kind of make a point of asking you as though it makes them feel better. You know? Like, you still here? Like, I, I want to finish before you. You know, I'm faster than you. I could do this, I could do that. And one of the things that I find we focus on a lot too is the whole notion of, of finishing young. All right, Cook came and said his daughter at 20 will have a jet license and this license and that license. And I give her a praise to that, right? That's great. Who will let a 20 year old fly a plane? Everybody go very quiet. You would. You would. And I would, I would fly in the plane, but that's not the world we live in. It's not the world we live in. And the truth be told, most of you who graduate at the age of 21 or whatever, with your engineering degrees or whatever degrees, when you get out there, when you get out there, you know, I hear people say all the time, I'm going to give up this portion of my life. You know, like, you sit and go or something. You know, I'm going to go into this cave that is UE. You know, and I'm going to, you know, have, have this time where I'm going to praise this God of education. And when it's done, I'm going to offer up my degree. And from heaven, and from heaven, just, just, you know, just from heaven, or from heaven, will come down, you know, all these things that I've always wanted, and I will live my life the way I want to live my life. If you believe that, <laughs> if you believe that that is true, it's not true. If you believe that life gets easier after university, that also is not true. As a matter of fact, it is the exact opposite. When you leave here, you will meet hundreds, if not thousands of young people who are just as bright as you, have degrees from more recognized universities, coming from different places where they have more experience, and what will matter in that instance is not your degree. It's not your degree. It's who you are and what you can do. I had a subject partnership um, at Desperado. It was just here came from MIT, study electrical engineering. And Pakistan made a story. She says, the day come down and she do electrical engineering, she take off Desperados. And the desk was going and playing and thinking, they were playing the part of it. Yes, we caught the lights. Now, I don't know how much I ended up when you get to know about lights and things, but when lights go by, we are doing sometimes, we just hook a lot of things up. And you don't need to go MIT to do that. So part two is the answer to her, you know, can you instruct them on how to do this? What can you do? What can you do? If everything around you was to crumble today, every single thing, all this was in this mashup, like a good already eating, what can you do? What can you do? Because you have to leave. The skills that you're doing here don't have to do anything. You have to leave. How many people are going to make a pan Where are you going to? We can't pan a nail. I mean, you laugh, but at the end of the day, we can't pan a nail. Can you build a shelf? Can you build a shoe? Can you do anything? No. But then we come and we create this world. We create this world here. And in this world, we're very intelligent. We use words like sophisticated and facilitude, right? <laughs> Never, I live in a couple of that. And we use those words. And in this world, we are the most intelligent people. But you step outside of that bubble, and I'm sure plenty of your figures. You go back to your neighborhood and you start talking, and you realize that you have to change your tone for people to understand it. Because all of a sudden you've learned this new language that you can't use anywhere else. Uh, all right? All of a sudden you have this new language that sometimes your mother will tell you, you what? You know, and you become this kind of alien thing. For me, the most important thing when I came in was to try to create an environment of my own. So we started the UE Speak. Where do you speak? Yeah? yeah? How many have been to UE Speak? Uh, all right, good. So we did some. Um, and we tried to build something from there. That didn't exist before I came here. And I agree with Kirk when he said that reality is to cook. When he said that reality is to be created. The reality of the, of, of the University of Western before we started that event was that it didn't exist. And that there was no real avenue for the musicians who were doing engineering or the writers who were studying chemical, biology, whatever, to do anything. That wasn't there. And if you want to have a holistic experience in this university, you have to pay for yourself. Nobody's going to give it to you. There are all kinds of opportunities to do all kinds of things, but nobody's going to come and tell you, this is what you have to do or that's what you have to do. You know, in Trinidad, most of us come from humble backgrounds. We don't come from, most of us, come from, we don't really come from the three-story house with air condition and your father have a Benz and your mother have a Benz. And most of us come from, from those kind of backgrounds, and it's difficult. And then when we come in here, we kind of gain these false aspirations and forget the fact that 
Understand this. Your education is not free. Okay? The government does not make money. There are people who work every single day who can't afford to come to university, who will never have the dream of coming to university, who did not finish primary school, but they pay tax. Their taxes pay for you to come to school to play the ass. Their taxes pay for you to come to school to track a game whole day, or to be on some fellow whole day, or to look pretty in your new shops, or whatever it is. And that's the reality of our living. The thing is that because we come in so young, we don't have that understanding. We just don't seem to have the understanding. And so what happens? What he just talked what he just talked about there. In a country where our very breath of life is creativity. I mean we were having a discussion earlier about how Trinidad Street is street theatre. You know? I was by that was man the other day. Yeah, that's like it. I know, I think that was. And um, this woman comes up, she weighing at least three hundred pounds. And she says, Yeah. Well, you know, I can't pass here and do it at the worst. So the devil's man shake his head and he puts out plenty of pepper. She did the devil and she goes and he says to me, she just passed here about 10 times for the day. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't know about you. You see, when I was coming here, I started to think, what am I going to say? I don't know, I ain't really doing that yet as far as I'm concerned. So I come here to say, you know, I'm not David Blaine, I don't know my, my breath on the water for 17 minutes, I can't come and tell you how I do that. I don't know if you have seen that lecture that he did, but you have to go and watch that too. That man's a freak. Um, <laughs> but, if you could have a lecture like this, wouldn't it be better? If there was something we could reconstruct, we really teach to be more interactive like this. So a teacher comes and doesn't do this. And so, what I have on the slide here, um, <laughs> is take down what's highlighted because that's, yeah. I mean, how many of y'all have been in classes where you just felt like, so why the hell I come into this class? Because I just get slides, I can read, I can read. <laughs> It's one thing to agree. It's one thing to agree. It's one thing to agree, but it's quite another thing to stand up and say, this is how I feel. This is how I feel. I mean, the guild, the university guild, has been somewhat of a defunct organization for a very long time. And it's not so much the guild fault. You know why it's not the guild fault? The guild has things to do. You come into office as a guild representative, you have all the stuff things that you need to get done before the years. And if you have anything that you want to do as your business, you do it in your own time. If you ever want to say anything done, you ever get up and say it for yourself. I submit that the UDSP is a perfect forum for people to come and say what you need to say and to move from there to actually do something. Because we all know these things. We don't learn the way we've been taught. We don't. We just don't. Halfway through the lecture, if you're going to fall asleep. You fall asleep. You don't want to be there unless you have a real love for what it is you're doing. But I guarantee the classes that create a lot are not like that. You know why? Because the people who go to those classes have a passion for what they do. They have a real passion for what they do. And unless they're real tired, they're not going to sleep in an acting class. They're not going to sleep even in the theory because they want to know. Most of the time. Most of the time. That's the honest to go to. If you don't believe me, go there now. You'll see them. I want you to get there, don't leave. You know? When I left engineering to write, people said to me, I met a professor a while after who had helped me to get in. Helped me after I learned how my grades are here. And um, he said, I heard you left. I so, said, yeah. He said, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm in literature, and, but I'm focusing on my writing. He said, boy, you know, you have to secure your future before you, 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 you know, before you, you, you walk on a limb like that. Look at me. I'm a musician, but I do my engineering, and I'm making sure I can live. And I looked at him. I took a very good look at this 60-something-year-old man who probably, at my age, had a dream of playing guitar or wanted to be in a band or wanted to sing, probably had a good voice. And he spent his years in school and he came out and he got his master's and he got his doctorate, started to teach. He had his children. And before he knew it, he was in the bank line signed up talking to a young man, giving him the exact opposite of the advice he probably should have given him. But really and truly, all you have in this life is your dream. That's all you have, you know. That's all you have. Really, really, that's all you have. And as, as airy fairy, that might sound to some people, all you have is that thing that since you're small, when you think about it, it is making you just move in your belly. You know that thing? I don't want to give any further. I'm talking about that thing. You know, when you pick up a pen and you say, I want to draw something, 
and if you, you yourself want to know what this is going to happen when I finish drugs, when you're dancing with someone, you just feel like you can just explode because it almost makes you feel like you're inhaling infinitely and you just can't take it no more. That thing. Not the thing that makes you go because you know that when you're done, there's a good job market for this type of person. Because what happens is, you go out there and you become very disoriented with the workplace and you just fall in line with the whole slew of disgruntled civil servants. And the whole country kind of grinds that nasty stinking hole because you don't want to do what you're doing. Um, I have no idea how relevant any of this has been. I do live half all this is down here thinking, wow, Jed, I mean, I really expected more. But this is what I have to offer. I don't really have anything else. I've never had anything else. This is what I have. And I'm going to profess to be some genius, and I'm going to profess to be some great writer, trying my best with what I've been given. And the truth that I have learned in this life is that from the time you're born, you know something about you. Nobody else don't know it. Right? You know something about you. You know that that is what you are. You're very, very clear about it. And as you progress, the world starts to tell you who you are. You're black, you're young, you're female, your nose too big, your bottom too big, your feet too flat, you can't dance, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. And you accept it. You are a scientist, you're good at math, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. You accept all those things. And somewhere underneath there is the you that was born, that you know you are. It's right there, you know. Right here. And I'm just waiting for you to say, hey, who's he seeing? Long time no see. What do you want to do? And sometimes that way you want to do is literally a walk off an edge into not knowing what you're about to do with your life. Up to two years ago, I still regretted the fact that I had left civil engineering. Every time I thought about it, I felt as though I had run away from something. And I hate not to finish something. It is the worst feeling for me to feel as though I've given up. You know? But since I started writing, the things that have happened to me in my life, and the places that I've gone because of it and the people that I've met. I wouldn't trade the last three years of my life for a lifetime of money, wealth, whatever, whatever. I always say I live my life in a way that if I was to die today, I can say I live a good life. If I job don't get on the stage right now, um, I, 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 I think I would have been, I would have felt fulfilled. I think my soul would be able to look down at my body lying like this and say, hey, I, well, that wasn't bad. <laughs> I wasn't bad at all. I wasn't bad. You know? And I think most I can do in seven years like you could hope for. So I do this of running over and over and talking too much and not leaving at a nice point. I just want to say that. But there's a you inside of you that you know. I'm not into the cliche thing that everybody if you hit for the, if you hit for the stars, you land on the moon. And then they ask you on the moon and you'll be cold and you'll be cold. <laughs> Go where you want to go, you know, if, if it, and, and do a lot more than what they say. I might not even laugh, laugh, it's your business. If you want to be a garbage man, be the best goddamn garbage man to have on the face of the earth. If you want to be a writer, be the best writer, and be happy at being a writer. So that when you come to talk to people, right, and you're talking to them, they don't feel like it's a normal cemetery, but they feel like it's a normal place where things grow in, you know, where things happen. Because I think a lot of our lecturers are dead. I think that's what happened to them, and that's why they can't get to us, because they're dead. I don't know what time, I know. I'll finish it. And they're dead. And it's not their fault, well, it is their fault in a way, because there's an exact point in your life where you choose to live or choose to die. And I think it's a dream, and the you that you know is you, that keeps you alive. So if there's any choosing and you have for follow up, that's what I could tell you. Keep